So this, this morning, I've been asked to give a talk about mm -hmm. the life of Oliver Cromwell. And we've already had the question raised this morning, what is it in life that you're willing to fight for and even die for? And Oliver Cromwell, if you've ever heard of him, he is one of the most divisive characters in all of English history. He is rightfully loved and fondly remembered by Bible-believing Christians for being the Lord Protector of the British Commonwealth, the Defender of the Protestant Faith, and arguably he is the Father of the British Empire. In contrast, he is absolutely despised by the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. You can read about them in your literature on your desk. And by liberal historians the same, because he had the sinful and tyrannical King Charles I deposed, taken off the throne, and he provided Britain with godly leadership based upon the teachings of the King James Bible. And I believe that it is only uh, right and fitting today to begin with a, a short Bible reading. And I'm going to read from Hebrews 11, verses 33 to 34. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And I want to draw your attention to the following parts of the verses that I've just read. Through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness was made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And to me this sums up the life of Oliver Cromwell. In my opinion, he was the most godly leader that England has ever known and probably will ever know. As we hear about this man of God, we'll learn about how he loved the Lord, how he resisted evil and sinful men, how he loved his country, how he loved the people of this country, how he loved the Lord's people abroad, and how he provided England with freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. Freedom of conscience being defined as the freedom to worship the Lord as your conscience guides you, and this was not allowed in the Roman Catholic nations. We understand today that our government and our monarchy indeed is shambolic, it's corrupt, they are a disgrace. They do not care about the Lord, they do not care about us, and they do not care about our freedoms. This is evidenced by the tyranny that we ourselves have experienced in our own lifetimes, particularly since the year 2020 and onwards. And it is highly doubtful that we'll ever see a leader like Oliver Cromwell in the political realm of England ever again. This man was a true patriot, and his memory, for the most part, has been destroyed in this country by those who hated him and for what he stood for. But I believe that every Christian ought to know about him, and especially if you live here in England. I'm going to talk about Oliver Cromwell's youth, his beginnings. In terms of Cromwell's youth, he was born on the 25th of April, 1599, into a middle-class family in Huntingdon, Cambridgeshire. If you know anything about biblical history, you'll understand that the majority of the Lord's people at this time were reading from the Geneva Bible. The AV 1611 was going to be published in years to follow. Cromwell said of his youth, I was by birth a gentleman, living neither in any considerable height nor yet in obscurity. So we see the Lord, he placed him in the middle, not being born into great riches, but not into poverty either. Oliver Cromwell, he did, however, have some connections that would put him in good stead to lead the nation. Cromwell, he was related to Sir Richard Cromwell, the personal minister of King Henry VIII. It is also said that Cromwell met King James, the king who authorised our Bible to be translated as a boy, 
when King James I visited Hitchinbrook on his royal visit uh, to the stately mansion of Sir Richard Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell, like many of us, he experienced sadness and bereavement in his childhood. He was the only son born to his parents amongst nine sisters. Three of his sisters died not long after they were born. Cromwell went to school in Huntington and he enrolled at Cambridge University when he was 17. And there is not much said about where or when Oliver Cromwell got saved, but we read that he was heavily influenced by Sir Thomas Beard, a Puritan Reformed preacher who was Cromwell's grammar school teacher. And Thomas Beard taught his students about the Lord, the Bible and the Gospel. So we can assume that this was when Cromwell first began to personally know the Saviour. As I've said about the Geneva Bible, this is the Bible Cromwell read from his youth and he identified as a Calvinist Puritan. We read that he held to the doctrine of eternal security for the believer and there's more to be said on this as we get into the message. In 1617, when Oliver Cromwell was 18 years old, his father sadly died and his mother was left to bring up her remaining children on her own. Oliver Cromwell's father at the time had been the MP, Member of Parliament for Huntington, and it wouldn't be long until Oliver followed his father's footsteps into British politics. Cromwell married young. He married Elizabeth Bourchier when he was 21, and Elizabeth was the daughter of a wealthy London businessman, and the two had nine children together. This was not uncommon at the time. Cromwell first began his journey into politics when he was 29, and he entered Parliament for the first time as an MP. And the job of being a, a Member of Parliament did not pay well, so he topped up his income by farming rented lands down at St Ives. He was no stranger to hard work. And we read that Oliver Cromwell, because of the tyranny of King Charles, seriously considered moving his family to the United States in the early 1630s in order to escape the royal oppression, but this was not to be the case. The Lord had a work for Cromwell to do right here in England that would change the course of history. The next part I'm going to talk through is the Civil War, the English Civil War. And before we go into this in detail, we should understand some of the history and events surrounding the reign of King Charles I and why exactly the people of England wanted him off the throne. Here is the, a quote from the 1847 book, The Protector of Vindication. The civil war was the proclamation of the illegality of absolute power and the struggling against royal tyranny. In 1625, King Charles I, the son of King James, became the King of England after his father had died. And he was not a good leader in many ways. He did many things to drive the people of England into desperation. And here are some of the complaints, the grievances that the people of England had against their king. Firstly, King Charles did not respect the laws of the land. He believed in lex rex, which means the king is the law. If the king says it's Wednesday, it's Wednesday. Nobody can challenge him. It's a total military dictatorship of the land. The King James Bible reading Puritans the Geneva Bible being largely replaced by 1642, and the men of Parliament rallied against this king, believing that the law was the king, and the only true king is the Lord Jesus Christ. All other monarchs must be restrained by the law in order to avoid a total military dictatorship. And this is what is known as limited government. And these principles would go on to be put uh, in the later American Constitution. So King Charles violated many laws. He believed he was the law and he infringed upon the rights that are enshrined in the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was a legal document drawn up in 1215 that guaranteed the people of England certain freedoms and liberties and placed restraints on the king's power. This document is the foundation upon which the British legal system was built. The Magna Carta proclaims that citizens have the right to justice and a fair trial with a jury. This protects citizens from being kidnapped and thrown into jail simply because the king does not like them. 
It proclaims that the law is above all men and it applies to all men equally. It allows all free men to own and inherit property. Now King Charles began to cause problems because he did not respect the law and he did not agree that there should be any restrictions on his power. As I've said, he believed in the doctrine of Lex Rex, the king is the law, and he also believed in the doctrine of divine right, the thing that all monarchs, kings and queens, were appointed by God to rule on his behalf, and as such they were to be obeyed in all things, even in the vilest acts of tyranny. As such, the law did not mean anything to him, and King Charles wanted to govern as an absolute monarch. And he goes on to commit further crimes against the people of England. He had his army steal lands and property at will, randomly. It didn't matter. If you owned land legally, and if you had the paperwork to prove that you had bought it and paid for it, if the king wanted it, he could take it from you. He overtaxed his people, and he placed them under impossible financial burdens for his own profit to top up his own coffers. He oppressed the poor with hefty fines. He allowed King Louis XIV of France to have command of the Royal Navy and this Roman Catholic leaning king then in turn used our navy to sink the Protestant Huguenot fleet in 1625, further agitating the Puritan Parliament to take up arms against their king. He suppressed the rights of the Puritans and he attacked their religious liberties and freedoms. These Puritans were men who were preaching the Bible's plan of salvation, the gospel and reading from their King James Bibles. It is also worth mentioning that the king was highly influenced by his Roman Catholic wife, much to the detriment of the Bible-believing men and women of this country. So all of these offences set the stage for the English Civil War to take place. And we'll hear that the king committed further crimes against the people of England during the course of the Civil War. So all of this agitation, all of these problems that are happening at the time, they lead to thousands of Bible-believing Christians to leave England and to move to America. And the situation in England was so dire that Cromwell himself, as I've said, nearly departed from England, but he was persuaded to stay. There is a time to move and a time to fight and the Lord will guide you personally on that. So the division really begins in January 1642. The division and outrage begins to build in Parliament and Charles I, the King, paranoid about the people of England taking up arms and rebelling against him, suspended Parliament and England, as I've said, was to be effectively placed under a total military dictatorship. And this was the final straw. This meant that there was to be no representation of the people in government. There was just to be the king's rule. And this event led to civil unrest and Cromwell was one of the many who were furious at this act of tyranny. John Bradshaw, the then president of the High Court of Justice in London, called King Charles I a tyrant, a traitor, a murderer and a public enemy. And Parliament was then left with a choice to do nothing or to take up arms against the tyrannical King Charles I and to fight. The following is taken from the ninth edition of Encyclopaedia Britannica, volume 6. With no knowledge of the art of war but much of himself, of men and of the Bible, this stout English squire had made up his mind in no hasty or factitious spirit to draw the sword against his king and venture his life for what he believed with his whole heart and soul to be the cause of freedom and the truth in Christ. Now, contrary to what many historians say, Cromwell did not want a civil war. He was not a bloodthirsty man, and he sought to reason with the king, to negotiate, to find a middle ground. King Charles, however, in his pride, would not negotiate. He would accept none of the terms of Parliament, believing himself to be above them as their king, and as such Cromwell understood that the time for talking was over. The parliamentarians, or the roundheads as they're called, were going to be forced to fight. And what really ignited the conflict was when Oliver Cromwell learned about what the king had been doing in secret. 
Charles I had been making secret agreements with foreign enemies, and I'll talk about this in detail in a moment. It was no conspiracy. And this was an act of high treason. And Cromwell learned that the king was prepared to unite with the enemies of England in order to defend his reign and to put down the uprising. We read that King Charles I paid an Irish Catholic army and Roman Catholic foreign mercenaries to march on the Protestant English people and to put down the resistance. The king signed a treaty with the Irish Catholics and he secretly negotiated and brokered a deal with the Roman Catholic leaning French. In in return for the support of the Roman Catholics, King Charles I agreed to close down Protestant churches and to expel their leaders from the nation. So places like this would be shut down. What we learn here is that King Charles I would deal with anybody just as long as he could remain king. This ungodly king had no morals, no scruples. He simply wasn't bothered, and as such he was a total tyrant who would do anything to hold on to his power, even if it meant joining up with the Pope and undoing the great work of the Reformation. Isaiah 59 verse 19 says this, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The Lord will defend his truth. And so in 1642, the war begins. The king assembles an army made up of soldiers who are loyal to him. And also he brings in foreign mercenaries from abroad. As I've said already, Charles I colluded with Catholic mercenaries from Europe in order to suppress the Protestant Puritans as he could not rally enough support from the patriotic English at home. Cromwell, on the other hand, assembles an army made up from the common men of the land, these people being mainly Puritans or independent Christians, Baptists, who understood that they were going to have to fight for their freedoms and they were willing to die to resist tyranny. And these men were to be known as the Parliamentarians or the Roundheads. Cromwell hired many Bible-believing men into his army of Roundheads, including Anabaptists, Puritans and Calvinists, and it is said that he loved his men as if they were his own sons. His armies would march holding scripture banners, singing hymns, and praying together. Singing hymns. Cromwell is quoted in saying, A few honest men are better than numbers. He was not intimidated by the king's sizable army. Cromwell's army, in fact, began with just ten men, taken mainly from his own family. So England was divided, and both sides prepared for war. And many battles were fought between the two sides. Cromwell lost his first battle against Prince Rupert's horsemen, his cavaliers, so he assembled a a, a cavalry regiment called the Ironsides, which would prove to be unbeatable by the royalist armies. And undeterred by his initial defeat, he loses his first battle. Oliver Cromwell would lead his men to fight the battles of Naseby, Marston Moor, Dunbar, Worcester, Drogheda and many others. And would you know, Oliver Cromwell's army, they won all of these battles. This civil war, it was a conflict between those who wanted freedom of conscience versus those who wanted an absolute monarchy. A war fought to secure the freedoms of the people of England. And as I've said already, Cromwell loved his men. They followed him to their deaths. Oftentimes, Cromwell, he would pay their wages from his own pocket because at times the war effort meant that they were short of money. Cromwell would sometimes run out of money and he would weep during these times because he loved his men. He did not want any of them to suffer more than they had to during this war. He truly loved them. He was a man of God. And the Lord, I believe, he heard Cromwell's prayers, his petitions, and many, including friends and family members, felt compelled to send him money to support him, to pay his men's wages in order to sustain the war effort. On the other side of this conflict, King Charles I when he ran short of funds, would turn to Rome for support, whose cardinals and priests could provide uh, practically limitless reserves of money and gold. We understand that the Vatican had greatly prospered throughout the Dark Ages from taking money away from the nations of Europe through plunder, robbery and the sale of indulgences. So the Civil War concludes in 1651, as Cromwell's army had defeated the Royalists and King Charles I was arrested for high treason.
King Charles I was tried in court and he was found guilty of treason. He was sentenced to death by beheading at Whitehall in London. Oliver Cromwell, as I've said, was not a bloodthirsty man and he did not personally want the kit to see the king executed. But he was bound by the laws of the land and by law this was the punishment that was to be dealt out to traitors. The king during his trial refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the court. As far as the king was concerned, as I've said, he was the law. He was the king ab above all the laws. That's what he believed about himself, the highest authority in the land. And as such, the king barely spoke a word. Once the king was sentenced to death by beheading, his son Charles II tried to appeal the verdict, but this appeal was denied. On the day of King Charles' execution, he prayed his last prayer to God and he was then beheaded in public for all to see. It is said that his execution took 15 minutes to perform. Cromwell was highly criticised for this event and he was under a lot of pressure to call off the execution. But the trial was fair, it was legitimate and the laws were followed. Cromwell firmly believed that he was in the will of God and so he remained unmovable in his leadership. Cromwell, out of respect for the king, ordered that the king's head be sewn back onto his body so that they would not put his head on display on London Bridge. He did not relish in bloodshed and he did not want to see the former king become a grotesque uh, spectacle after his death. But this same grace, however, would not be extended to Cromwell after his death. And there are many other events that took place during the Civil War and afterwards that I do not have time to cover today, but there, are, there were a couple of key events that took place uh, following the King's execution. Cromwell, he became the Lord Protector of the British Commonwealth and the Defender of the Protestant Faith. He refused to become King himself and the UK became a Republic for a short time as there was no King on the throne. The nation greatly prospered under Cromwell's godly leadership and Cromwell held enough influence in Europe to cause the Spanish and French governments to put a stop to the persecution, torture and murder of Bible-believing Protestants on the continent. He wasn't afraid of anybody, not even the Pope himself. We read from the life of Oliver Cromwell, 1854, he also took pains to let the Pope understand that he, did, that he knew him to be at the bottom of the unnatural persecution and if he did not beware, he would see his ships in the harbour of Civita Vecchia and hear the thunder of his cannon around the Vatican. He not only protected the Lord's people here in the United Kingdom, but his influence let also led to Bible-believing Christians being protected from persecution abroad. He'd even stand up to the Pope himself. Now, in terms of his personal life, the man behind these deeds, Oliver Cromwell's personal life was full of tragedy and sorrow, and he suffered from many bereavements. But the Lord, he continued to sustain him. As I've said, he had nine children, and he lived to see the death of four of them. Can you believe it? His daughter, Elizabeth Cromwell, died of an illness when she was 29. And we read about his tender heart towards his daughter, the Lady Claypole, Elizabeth Cromwell, his favourite daughter, was taken sick with a fatal and most painful disease. The protector was forgotten in the father and hurrying to Hampton Court, he took his place by her bedside, overwhelmed with sorrow. Her convulsions, her cries of distress tore his heartstrings asunder and shook that strong and affectionate nature to its foundations. His kingdom, his power, the commonwealth were all forgotten and for 14 days he bent over his beloved child. When she died, it broke his heart. He collapsed immediately, and he was too grief-stricken to attend her funeral. We read that Cromwell enjoyed a, ver a very close relationship with his other daughter, Bridget. He wrote to her oftentimes, and in one letter he writes this, Dear heart, press on. Let no husband, let not anything, cool thy affections after Christ. I hope he will be an occasion to inflame them. That which is best worthy of love in thy husband is that of the image of Christ which he bears. He wanted his daughter to stay close to the Lord and to marry a godly man who put the Lord first. And Cromwell's three sons, they died young of illnesses. So Cromwell would later also weep over the death of his mother. And his mother uh, played a big role in his life. <laughs>
and we read about the death of his mother in, from the life of Oliver Cromwell. This is J.T. Headley, 1948, and she says in her dying moments, the two are together, the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, she said, and comfort you in all your adversities and enable you to do great things for the glory of the Most High God and to be a relief to his people. My dear son, I leave my heart with thee. Good night. And closing her eyes, she breathed forth her spirit to the God who gave it. Cromwell gazed a moment on her pallid features and then burst into a flood of tears. What a picture does he, the Lord Protector of England, the hero of so many battlefields, the resolute, iron-willed man present, weeping beside his aged mother. He was a man of war, a man feared by many. He'd stand up to kings and tyrants. He was known for being a rock-solid fighter, but deep down he was a tender-hearted Christian man who went through many trials and tribulations throughout the course of his life. He suffered from illnesses, bereavement, financial problems and constant contention even from other Christians and in spite of all these things the Lord sustained him and he remained an honest and a humble man right until the end of his life on the 3rd of September 1658 at the age of 60 years old. And to finish with I want to review some of the key lessons that we can learn from his life and review some of his most famous quotes. Firstly, Oliver Cromwell, despite his enormous success and his later fame and fortune, remained a humble man of God all the way through his life until the end. The men of his government wanted to make a statue of him after the war, and we read the following quote from E.M. Bounds on prayer. On one occasion, while looking at some statues of famous men, he turned to a friend and said, Make mine kneeling, for thus I came to glory. He gave the glory to God. Whenever anything good happened in Oliver Cromwell's life, he would give the glory to the Lord. He was a humble man. Secondly, Oliver Cromwell was an honest man. He was not interested in putting on false appearances. When they wanted to paint a portrait of him, he told the painter, I desire you would use all of your skill to paint your picture truly like me, but remark all these roughness, pimples, warts and everything as you see me. Otherwise, I will never pay a farthing for it. In other words, paint me warts and all. He was honest without pretense and this virtue continued throughout his life. He was sincere and genuine. And thirdly, Cromwell was an, a great leader. He was probably one of the best leaders there ever was. And one of Cromwell's most famous quotes that he told his men was to trust in God and keep your powder dry. He was a fantastic leader and he encouraged his men above all things to trust in the Lord and to be prepared. Cromwell would oftentimes sleep beside his troops on the cold earth outdoors in England. He was not a leader who was an armchair general. He would be right there on the front lines with his men in the trenches and they would go through the hard times together. He himself trusted the Lord for his salvation and he is quoted in saying, in prayer to the Lord, it was overheard, tell me, is it possible to fall from grace? Faith in the covenant is my only support, yet if I believe not, he remains faithful. Three times he cried out, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Lord, though I am but a miserable and wretched creature, I am in covenant with thee through grace. And his faith inspired his men. And he was also a godly leader in wartime. He told his men as they went to Scotland that, if they, that he had brought plenty of hemp with him, plenty of rope, should they begin to rape, murder and pillage their way through the land, through the Scottish villages. In other words, he would not tolerate sin and wickedness amongst his soldiers. He kept them in line and he would hang those who would be tempted to commit terrible war crimes and atrocities upon civilians. He was merciful towards his enemies and after the war he pardoned many royalists who had been taken as prisoners of war. He would stand up to any sinful man as I've said and he would boldly meet his enemies at the gate. He would not shy away from confrontation. He was a fighter. And as I've already said, he wasn't afraid to stand up to the kings of France and Spain. And just like Martin Luther, he wasn't even afraid to stand up to the Pope himself. Proverbs 28 verse 1. The wicked when no man pursueth. Sorry, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. And lastly, under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, England was brought under the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant, when Cromwell allowed the Jewish people to settle in England in 1655 without persecution. 
after they had been expelled from England previously in 1290 during the Dark Ages. And from this point onwards, England begins to prosper like it never had done before. He made godly decisions when he was in power and the people rejoiced. So that, that is a brief summary of the life of Oliver Cromwell, the protector, and in my opinion, the greatest leader that this nation has ever known. Amen.